Thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. To know more about us, go to identitychurch.net, where you'll find resources such as a calendar, media, and upcoming events. You may also download an app for your mobile device from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Then from your mobile device, you can hear our messages, read from the Bible, take notes, connect with us on the social media, and even pay your tithe. Again, thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. Thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. To know more about us, go to identitychurch.net, where you'll find resources such as a calendar, media, and upcoming events. You may also download an app for your mobile device from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Then from your mobile device, you can hear our messages, read from the Bible, take notes, connect with us on the social media, and even pay your tithe. Again, thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Anthony. I, I know most of you, like 90% of you, a few I, you I don't know. Um, I'm Anthony. Um, the last time I spoke from the pulpit here was December 8th, 2019. Um, and one of the things I said when, when I spoke that day was I was, and it was weird because I didn't have this, and you know, I had something I wanted to talk about, and then God said, listen, I want you to go up there. And this is December 8th, 2019. He goes, I want you to say that the gospel is like a flu virus. I'm like, what does that mean? And so he goes, look up a virus. And I looked it up. I'm like, oh, that works. And, you know, a virus finds a host and attaches to a host. And I, I got up here and I talked about how the gospel of Christ is like a virus. And viruses can infect everybody and go around. I had all this stuff. I'm like, that's a good word. And then three months later, I'm like, uh-oh. So I want to say the gospel is like hitting the lottery, okay? It's like if everyone hit the lottery, you know? So let, let's just start this year off that way. But, um, but it's true. I mean, I, another thing that happened last year, is, as Rodney said, was I had weight loss surgery. <clears throat> and it was something that I had taken years and years to decide whether I wanted to do it or not. And I kind of always did, but I didn't know what to do. And then I married the love of my life, Kamani, who's videotaping me with her phone. And she was like, if you want to do it, I'll support you. Let's do it. And I got it done. At the time when I had it done, I was around 440 pounds. Um, I thought I was going to die on the table. I was like, I'm not going to make it through this. And um, I remember being wheeled in. And I, you know, like they always say when you go under anesthesia, you know, I remember sitting there and I'm like, okay, tell me when. And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, oh, this is. And then I was like, you know, the next thing I knew, I woke up a minute later. I'm like, okay, well, when are we going to do this? And they're like, we've done this. And I'm like, really? So. It, it, it's it's totally changed my life. Um, you know, I get people that come up to me and they're like, you're doing so good. You're doing so good. I'm like, no, I had radical reconstructive surgery that made it to where I cannot eat. I, there's nothing about willpower in what I've done to my body here. It's all thanks to the surgeon. <laughs> um, and I've become, you know, I've become an evangelist for weight loss surgery for people who need it. I, I've, I've told so many people about it. I've, I've offered to take people to meetings about it. And then COVID hit and you can't go to a meeting anymore, even at the hospital about it. But there's Zoom stuff. So I've been encouraging people to, to do that and to, you know, to make a change in your life. You know, change is good. I'm afraid of change. I don't like it. And speaking of change... Um, tomorrow, I work at R.C. Hill Mitsubishi. I sell cars. I've been there 11 years. Um, I, I started there at the bottom of my financial life. I was living in a place I would never want to live, and, and you know, I had nothing. I had nothing. And I finally was like, I got to you know, get up and get a job. I had lost my, my job previously, and I just was depressed and unhappy. And um, Charlie told me about this guy he knew that worked at a car dealership and said, you need to go talk to him. And so I went in and, you know, I show up at this car dealership wearing a suit and tie, you know, because I thought that's what you'd need to do to sell cars. And, you know, and, he, you know, I walked in, I said, yeah, I want to sell cars. And um, I said, I know Charlie Coker. He goes, oh, you know, Charlie. He goes, OK, we'll hire you. I'm like, really? Awesome. <laughs> and he goes, but don't wear a suit. <laughs> and so. 
you know, I started that and I, I had sold cars a long time before that and I got out of it because it was such an unscrupulous business and I didn't like it. But this place was different and it's been different for 11 years. And tomorrow is my last day at the car dealership. I've put in my, um, my resignation. I'm leaving on good terms. I will be then taking my real estate course. Um, I'm taking classes. It's a one-week class. And then I'll be working for someone else in this church, Jennifer Clark. <laughs> and um, it's funny because, I mean, I've, I know a lot of people in real estate. Um, you know, one, my, my second family is the Formosos and the Siracos, and they're all in real estate. And everyone, when I said I was going to get in real estate, I, my initial thought was, of course, I'm, you know, Formosos. They, they've been after me for years to do this. And I woke up one morning, and God said, no, no, you're going to call Jennifer Clark. And I'm like, no. <laughs> me and Jennifer had a little bit of a history you know, I mean, she was my landlord for a time, and it didn't necessarily end well, you know what I mean, <laughs> for either one of us. It wasn't bad, necessarily, but it wasn't great. And I'm like, there's no way. Like, that's, no, that's devil. Get behind me. That's not you talking. That's not God. <laughs> and so I, I came to men's group that night, and Louie walked in. And I didn't know Louie also worked for Jennifer. And, and I started sharing with the girls. I'm, I'm like, guys, I think I'm going to go into real estate. And, and, and Louie's like, you know who you need to talk to? Jennifer Clark. And I'm like, this is the same day as God told me this. I'm like, okay, maybe it's not the devil talking, but me, it's a familiar spirit telling me this now. Okay, I'll, I'll go down a notch. And um, so I was like, really, Jennifer Clark? He goes, yep, yep. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I'll think about it. I'll pray on it. That's what we say. You know, I'll pray on it, man. And um, I go home that night and, and I'm, you know, I'm really considering this. And the next day, my landlord comes to my house, my, my current landlord, who's a great man of God. Well, I, I don't even know if he's a man of God, but he's a great man. Um, and he knows real estate. <laughs> he knows real estate and he actually used to teach the real estate courses. So I'm just kind of picking his brain and I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm looking to get into real estate. I'm thinking about, what do you think? He goes, I think that'd be a great job. He goes, there's somebody you need to talk to. Her name is Jennifer Clark. And I'm like, okay, God. <laughs> I will talk to Jennifer Clark. So I made the awkward phone call. <laughs> And it's just, it's, it's been great. And we, you know, we, we, we talk, I mean, we had a great meeting about, you know, me looking to get into this. She gave me amazing advice and we didn't even talk about it at the end. I'm like, listen, I want to clear the air on a little something here. And it just all cleared up, you know, it, it was awesome. And I'm excited, um, you know, whether or not she gets her pound of flesh out of my commissions is fine. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no, it's, it's going to be, an ex I'm scared of this adventure. I mean, I'm leaving a job where I know how much money I make to, for a while, making nothing. Um, I've, but I talked to my wife, because, you know, you can't do these things without a family discussion. And we went away last weekend, and, and we just talked about it. And I was like, how? And she's like, I've been waiting for you to make this decision. I've been waiting. Let's do it. And I talked to Charlie. He's like, you're in the right timing. And I talked to my boss at work who said, that's the devil talking. You're staying here. <laughs> and so it's been interesting because most people that leave a car dealership don't give notice. You know what I mean? Because most of the time, if you leave a car dealership, you're going to another car dealership and you don't give a notice. You just Friday night, you're like, guys, I won't be back anymore. But that's not what I'm doing. So I've been able to talk to my boss. And by the way, my manager who I do prison ministry with, is going to be preaching here on the 21st. And he's an awesome guy, great man of God, has been preaching. He's been preaching in the prison system for 30 years, and he's got an amazing gift, and he's never been recorded preaching. Because you can't bring recording equipment in a prison. And I'm like, I, I told Charlie, I'm like, it's time. It's time for this guy to, to be, to, let's get him a package of him preaching and let's, so he can share it with people. It's time to get him out of the prison and into, into churches. So I'm so pumped up for him. Um, and that's going to be exciting. But today I want to talk about something. And Charlie called me up on Wednesday night and asked me if I would speak today. And I said, sure. I was like, absolutely. I'm ready in season and out of season. And I hung up the phone. I'm like, I have nothing to talk about. <laughs> I'm like, why did I say yes to this, God? 
And um, he said, no, no, you got some stuff to talk about. Um, as you guys know, I haven't been here much in the last several years. Um, I'm busy. Work, you know, one of the, the, the main reason I'm going into real estate and getting out of the car business is because at a car dealership, it's a great job. It's provided me, but I'm a, I'm a glorified Walmart worker because it's retail. There is no time off. There's no, hey, I got to go to church. Okay, as long as church is over by the time this dealership's open, you can go wherever you want. We're at 10 a.m. start church. It ain't happening, you know. Um, real estate, I, I know I got to bust my butt for a while, but one of the things Louie promised me, he's like, listen, eventually there'll be a time where you'll be able to come to church. You'll be able to do stuff. You know, you, you know it's a little more of setting a schedule. You know, okay, I can meet you at one o'clock on a Sunday. You know, there's a little more things I can do. It's, that's the main reason I wanted out of the car business. Um, and so I'm excited about that. So I'm back. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm excited. Um, I won't, the only times I won't be here is the first Sundays of the month and if there's a fifth Sunday, because those are my prison times. I go to the prison, I preach at the prison, it's my heart, um, it's an amazing thing to do, and it's much easier than preaching here because if they don't like what I say, I can have them thrown in the hole for a while. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. <clears throat> but, um, you know, I, I do watch our services online. And there's been a theme lately that's going on in this church, and it's about evangelism. And it's about outreaches. And it's about having souls saved. It's not about putting butts in the seats. It's about putting souls in the kingdom. And that's what the flavor is right now. It's like, okay, God, that's what I got. And what do you got for me on that? And God gave me a bunch of stuff. And I was like, all right, um, this is not like the kindest thing I've ever written here, God, you know? And he's like, well, you can make it kind if you want to. And so I was like, well, let me run this by Charlie. So I, I sent it all to Charlie and Charlie said, listen, this is exactly what we need. So he's like, this is what I want you to talk about. I said, okay. And so if I was to have a title today, it would be having an identity crisis at Identity Church. Um, subtitle, you don't have to be an evangelist to evangelize. So when, I mean, we, when we, I was, I'm, I'm happy to say I was the, actually the very first member of this church. I mean, when Charlie told me he was starting a church, I was like, I'm in. I was there on day one. And, you know, I mean, we were initially called One Kingdom Fellowship. And everyone thought we were Jehovah's Witnesses. And then we became Identity Church. And the trans community came out and said, this is where we got to go. And, but no, <laughs> it's just been interesting. But no, I mean, identity is, is an amazing name for a church. And, but I wanted to look it up. So I was like, okay, God, so if I'm having an identity crisis at identity church, what does that mean? He goes, let's look up definitions of some stuff. I said, okay. So identity is the distinguishing character or personality of an individual. That's what our church is. We're, we're discovering our identity, our personality of an individual. And if you ever look on, you know, our, our little, little subtitle for our church is where sonship is revealed. I never understood that line. I thought it was a weird line. I've always thought it's a weird line. Where sonship is revealed. It's like, okay. So what does that mean? And sonship, the definition of sonship is the relationship of son to father. I'm like, well, that's good. <clears throat> revealed means to make known through divine inspiration. So we are basically a church that says we are finding our personality through the relationship of the son to the father, and we're revealing that through a divine inspiration. Like, that's, I'm on board with that. And then God said, but he, okay, he said sometimes, and, and well, I'm talking to, the, to our church here, right? Because I, I know most of you guys, and we're a little bit of an advanced church, right? I mean, I don't think I'm the only one guilty of when I witness somebody and they get saved, I kind of might send them to the journey or I might send them to Trinity or I might send them somewhere else. Cause when they come in here, they're just like, huh? You know, I mean, it's like, <laughs> you know, we serve, we serve, we're a steakhouse, right? We're not a, we're not a coffee shop where you eat bread and milk. We're a steakhouse, right? <clears throat> and, um, but sometimes I think we're so consumed with the continuation of having our sonship revealed to us, we forget that the point of realizing who we are is to help others realize who they are. 
we, we get into this zone here sometimes where we, we, get, so, we get so deep. And, and, and I just want to start off by saying that, that what I'm going to say here is not meant to agitate, but it is meant to confront, right? And we can confront in love. Because believe me, the first one confronted with this was me and who's still being confronted with it continually, right? So this is not like a, uh, this is like a, uh, you know? <clears throat> but like I said, there's a push in our church for evangelism. But are we ready for evangelism? Are we ready for, I, I, this morning when we were doing worship, I saw these altars. I'm like, they're so nice. They're so nice. And I'm like, but you know what? I would love to see these altars stained with blood of people who have come and laid down their lives. Because that's what an altar is. That's a place of sacrifice. And I'm not talking literal blood. You know what I mean, right? We didn't drink the literal blood of Jesus today. I'm talking about, this should be a place of, 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 of reconciliation, and this should be a place of, of, of man and woman coming and laying down their lives. This should be a, a place of death and then life at the same time. Are we willing to make the changes to make that happen, though? I mean, we're, we're an advanced church. Um, let me see here. Can we as a church... Okay, hold on one second. Can we as a church cater to the needs of the experienced believer as well as the new believer? And I have a scripture for that. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. Though I am, and I like the NIV version, though I am free to, and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all people so that by all means possible, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. So are we willing to become the one who can listen to the drug addict without judgment? Are we willing to become the one who can listen to the homosexual, the lesbian, the, the, you name it, to be, not, not to become them, but the one that can listen to them. And then guess what we do? We point them to Jesus, right? Because <clears throat> there's something, when I preach in the prison, there's something I say, and I mean it with all my heart. I, when I talk to unsaved people, and this is a mindset that I think we all need to grasp, I don't care about your sin issue at all. Your, if when I meet an unsaved person who's going through this, 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 I don't care about this, this, this. I care about the unsaved part. It's not my job to clean you up. It's his job to clean you up. It's my job to point you to the one who can clean you up. It's your job to point to the one who can clean the person up. A lot of times we as Christians get so focused on someone's sin. We get so focused on the issue of the day, abortion, gay rights. We get so focused on the issue that we forget the Christ is the answer to all of this. And when, when someone gets saved, God will work on their hearts. It's his job. It, it, our job is so easy. It's just to lead someone. Like, and you're literally leading people who are dying to life. I mean, it's really the easiest job in the world. But we make it complicated because we want to get in their business. Now, once they're saved and once they accept Christ, yes, there's discipleship. That's a whole other story, though. I'm not talking about that aspect right now. I'm just talking about what are we doing and, and what, 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 what part do we all have to play in this? Because we all have different parts in it, right? But guess what? We all have a part in it. And let's see here. Um, now, can we who live in a place beyond the cross, and we talk about that a lot here. Charlie talks all the time about how, you know, we, we go to, well, there used to be a cross up here, but we go to a place where the cross is and we kneel at the cross and then we walk past the cross because now we're walking in freedom and that's a great place. But guess what? Sometimes as a Christian, and when you see someone unsaved, you got to walk back and you got to snatch them and you got to pull them to the cross. <clears throat> All right, the, the best football teams in the world are ones who understand blocking and tackling and they go back to the basics. And if we as an advanced church, and I, I say advanced church just because I mean like we're all pretty prophetic here, we're all pretty spiritual here, you know what I mean? We kind of get stuff. But as, as people like that, if we can't go back to the basics of the first love, 
that we had when we first received Christ, if you remember that feeling where you didn't know anything else than I love Jesus, if we can't go back to that, we're never going to reach him because then we become a club amongst ourselves. And we come in here every Sunday and we hear a great message and it pumps us up. And then we go out and we keep that message in our own little family and we're going to run out of oil quickly. That's why we got to keep coming because we keep running out of oil. We're meant to give that oil. And I promise you, if you start pouring that oil out, it just refills. But if you hoard that oil, it ain't going to refill itself. Um, Jude 1, 23. I'm used to doing stuff on paper because in the prison I can't bring a laptop. So it's just my process. Um, Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And we can hate the clothing, but we don't hate the corrupted flesh, right? There's a big difference there, right? And guess what? So there there are times when we need to go literally snatch someone out of the fires of hell, and that's anyone who's not saved. Anyone who's not saved is a dead man walking or dead woman walking. But here's the cool thing. Anyone who's saved is completely free from sin. We're completely free. We don't realize it, which is, I, I think sometimes why we don't share the gospel the way we should is because we just don't realize what we really have. Or maybe we don't believe what we really have. I mean, if I was walking by a burning building and saw someone in it and I knew I could get in that building and pull them out, there would be no hesitation. But yet we're walking by burning buildings 24-7 with people that are literally dying. And, and I know there, you have to use discernment in things, you know what I mean? But gosh, here's the discernment. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples. Okay, yes, you're supposed to go do it. <laughs> you know, you don't got to ask, God, should I do this? Yeah, yeah, I told you to do it a long time ago, right? Um, but here's the thing. If we snatch someone from a fire, we might get a little burned. Are you willing to get a little burned? I mean, everybody, everybody wants to do stuff. You know, when um, the last time I was at the, the prison... When I go to the prison, basically my job there is to sing a song and to do prayer requests. And um, my manager, Tim, does most of the preaching. But I get to give like a little five-minute thing. And every, every time I go, you know, I, I listen to the worship. And they have, they have really good worship, you know. It's just a bunch of prisoners singing their hearts out. It reminds me of like a promise keeper meeting every time I go. It's just like, it's like you know, this old school stuff, and they, they really get into it. And, but um, and then they do the prayer request. And here's the prayer request every time. Okay, I got a sick family member. Okay, cool. Um, I need help with my prison sentence. Okay, that's cool. And the big one is, I want revival in the prison. I want this, you know, I want this, this place to explode with the love of Jesus. I want this to happen. That's the big one, always, right? And so I'm sitting there listening to that last month, and I was just aggravated after a while. I'm like, I've heard this for seven years. Like, and it, but it was, it was a good aggravation. It wasn't a bad aggravation, okay? It was just, there was something in me that I knew, okay, God, you're getting ready for me to, to say something here when I go and take these prayer requests. Um, and so I got up and I, I was like, you know, let's pray. And I was like, but before we pray, let me ask you guys a question. I was like, how many of you guys are saved? I, I like to give altar calls at the beginning of a service so I kind of know who I'm talking to, right? Like, I want to know who's saved. You know, I don't ask if you're not saved, raise your hands. I'm like, if you are saved, raise your hand so that way I can see who might not be, right? And um, everybody in there was already Christian, you know. It's very different from the prison to the jail. If you're in the jail, you get these people that don't know Christ because they're just there serving a little bit. Prison is like a church service because they're there for a long time. This is their church that they go to. So I knew everybody. I'm like, you guys are all saved. I was like, how many of you really want revival in this compound? Yeah, let's stand up. Raise our hands. All right. All right. Well, who's going to go make it happen then? What are you doing to make this happen here to, right now? Or are we just going to pray every month for God to do something and then go back and do exactly what we're doing, which hasn't caused revival to happen, and come back next month and ask for it again? You can pray till you're blue in the face. And if you don't follow it up with some actions, nothing's happening. I mean, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for Jesus himself to come down and start a revival? He's never doing it. How many of you guys are saved? You're all saved. How many of you, Jesus came and said, hey, follow me? No, someone spoke to you. Jesus spoke to you through someone. 
Remember that person, whoever it was that led you to God and become that person to someone else and you will see revival. That's, it's, it's, it's really that simple, but we don't understand it. We keep thinking that we're waiting on God when God is like, I'm waiting on you. And that, you know, one of the things that's what I love about what, what God does in my personal life is he always just takes like a, a very understandable truth and just makes me tilt it a little bit to see a different understanding of it. And when, when I do that, it gives me a freedom. One of the best ones that he ever showed me was about reading the Bible. Um, my, most of my Christianity, I struggled so much in, in reading the word of God. And I would say to myself, if I can just read this book enough, I won't sin today and I won't do something bad today. And, and I would, you know, Monday would come and I'd, I'd read a couple of chapters. I'd have a great Monday. Tuesday would come. I'd read a couple of chapters. I'd have a great Tuesday. Wednesday, I was a little busy. I couldn't read it. Wednesday night, I'd do something stupid. And, I'm, and then I would, hey, listen, I'll, Charlie, I love Charlie, but I go to school, well, did you read on Wednesday? And he throw it right at me. I'm like, no, I didn't read. I guess God hates me now. And so I'm like, maybe next week I'll start to read again. And, and that was my life for, for, oh, for most of my Christianity until one day God said, hey, how about you think of it like this? Don't try to read my word to get closer to me. If I could just show you how close I am to you, you'll want to read my word. Same exact thing, but just a little, little, little turn, little understanding of, and I'm like, now I like to read this word. It's not, I, I'm not a slave to this word. This word is food. This word is nourishment. This word is like a confirmation of who I am. So it's different. And I, and I think we, in so many things, we struggle about that. We struggle with that in our sin life. We struggle with, with, with all these things. Be, and I think it's just if we could just kind of take a little bit of a, a turn and understand that we're not doing things to attain closeness to God. You cannot get closer to God than you are right this second until you die and you're maybe like right here in his face. But you know what I mean? Like on this earth, you're as close to God as you'll ever be. You're as loved by God as you will ever be. And God will never leave you nor forsake you ever. And it's amazing. Never. It's not dependent on you. So if you leave this place and you go do some sin, he's still not leaving you. He's still not forsaking you. What happens is our, is our mind creates a condemnation and we think we're far off from God. BS, we're not far off from God. We're as close as we were to God as we ever were. He doesn't change. He doesn't, his, his love doesn't stop. All he looks at, I, I say sometimes, you know, and you have to understand the, 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 the understanding, I say God sees us through blood-colored glasses. You know, people say, oh, you just see the world through rose-colored glasses like you see everything good. God sees us through blood-covered glasses. He sees us through the lens of his blood. Because if he didn't, we would just like fry, <laughs> like immediately, right? None of us are perfect yet in the flesh, but in the spirit, we are as perfect as Christ ever was. It's, it's a weird understanding, but we, but we have to understand it. Um, so, so like I said, you do not have to be an evangelist to evangelize. And my scripture that I have for that is Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Nobody, listen, you, if you're praying for your family member to get saved or your neighbor or your, or your whatever, you better go help them get saved, you know? And if you don't have the guts to do it, that's fine. Then pray someone else comes into their life and does it. But come on, we can do this, right? And guess what? You don't, you don't have, you can get people saved without ever pointing a finger and showing them the way to hell. You can do, well, you, there's, you have to use discernment here. But the Bible tells me that it's the goodness of God that causes someone to repent, right? It's not the threat of hell that causes man to repent. Because if I don't believe in God, I don't believe in the devil. If I don't believe in heaven, I do not believe in hell. So it don't matter to me if I'm going there, if I'm not a born again Christian. So, I mean, I understand that, you know, for years we've, we've worked on fear-based witnessing, you know what I mean? And it works because it's, but because it, it strives up an emotional thing. And I'm like, I don't want to go to hell, but I don't know what hell is. So I better go accept Jesus. And they go out in the world and they're like, what are you out of your mind? You're like, 
yeah, I guess I was crazy. I didn't think of that stuff, you know? But, but when someone grasps how much God loves them, how can you not turn to what, you know, listen, look at all the, the societal issues we have right now. Black Lives Matter, trans rights, gay rights. It's all people wanting to be accepted. And the church has done a horrible job at accepting people. Jesus takes us in just as we are, and then he changes us. You know, when, when I speak at the, the women's jail, you know, um, there's a lot of lesbians in the women's jail, a lot. And, you know, I, when, I, when I give an altar call there, I say, listen, if you're in a certain relationship or you're living a certain lifestyle and you let that prevent you from coming up here and accepting the love of God, shame on you and you'll be held accountable for it. I'm not here to change you. I'm here to lead you to Christ. Now he will start talking to your heart. And, 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 and I tell him like, listen, if God never talks to you about this sin, then don't worry about it. But understanding he's going to, and I even say he's going to, but it's not my job to say you better repent from this before you receive Christ. You better receive Christ and then your heart will change because until you receive him, you ain't repented yet. Your heart's not right yet. Now, do we have to repent in order to receive Christ? Yes. But what does repentance mean? It means turning a direction. So what does that mean? The very act of saying of a non-believer coming to Christ and saying, Lord Jesus, I make you the ruler of my life, is the repentance that's required to receive Christ. Yeah. It's not, Lord Jesus, I'm this, 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 this. Now please fix me. He knows what you are. Yeah. He knows. He's going to take you just as you are, and then he's going to start working on you. Yeah. That's where discipleship comes in. That's why you can't just witness to somebody and get them saved and then leave them out in the world. You got you to bring them into a church. You know what I mean? And, and that's what we're getting ready for here. We're going to be having an outreach. And that outreach is to, to, to bless the community. But I would imagine, especially with an evangelist running this thing, that outreach is to get some souls saved. You know, I mean, listen, you can, you can, you can give away food and drink and T-shirts, and if they go home and die and go to hell, you've done nothing for them. So, you know, I mean, I know, I know the, the integrity of the people here is to get them saved. And then we got to decide, okay, if we get them saved, what, are we going to finally start saying, guys, come on, check this out. Check us out this Sunday. We're going to welcome you. Are we going to be able to welcome the new believer and still preach the gospel that gets preached out of this place? It's, it's a tricky tightrope, you know? And I asked Charlie about it before, and, and he, he's on board. He's like, well, I don't know how to do it. And I'm like, I don't think any of us know how to do it, but we got to figure it out. Most of the people in here are people that have been churched a long time and probably been burned by a ministry. And I've always said, Charlie, our church is like a Christian rehab center. <laughs> you know, they, they, they come in, they're burnt out, they've been used and abused by ministers. We bring them in here, we get them healed up, and then they go out and they do ministry. And that's awesome. That's a, that's a, that's a vital part of what we do. I love the fact that Charlie doesn't keep people here. In fact, Charlie will chase them out of here to go do what they're called to do. That's integrity. At the same time, we need to be able to get those guys who don't know Christ, don't understand the... We need to be able to give them milk and bread and graduate them to steak. Maybe we'll start off with some hamburger meat. It's easier than steak, right? We need, we need to grow people, right? And, and we can. And um, the next thing I wanted to say is... Not everyone is called to preach the gospel. But everyone is called to spread the gospel. There's a difference. The definition of a preacher is the, of preaching is to deliver a sermon or religious address to an assembled group of people typically in a church. The definition of a witness is one who has personal knowledge of something by public affirmation, by word or example of usually religious faith or conviction. I'm called to be a preacher. It's something I thought everyone was called to be when I first became a Christian. I was 18 years old. 
I came down to Florida from New Jersey. Somebody had told me about Jesus a little bit. I kind of understood him, but I didn't really. I went to a church and I, I walked in the church and said, I want to be a Christian. How do I do it? And the pastor said, I'm going to show you. And then the next thing out of the pastor's mouth was, hey, Charlie Coker, come take this kid under your wing. You know, that's how I met the man. And, you know, I love Charlie Coker. Um, he gave, he, he was teaching a Bible study at the time for new believers. And, and he said, one of the things he said was, he said, don't be afraid. If you feel a calling in your heart to ask God what that calling is and to show you in scripture. And this is before cell phones. So it wasn't like I could Google stuff, you know, all I had was this Bible, which I, this is my first Bible. I used to walk around with this thing. Like, oh, it didn't matter where I was. I'd walk, I'd walk up to people on the street and I, I'd be like, do you know Jesus? And I I'd do all this stuff. I, I remember calling Charlie one night because we started learning about laying on the laying on of hands. I called him one night from a CVS because I was just praying for people as they were coming out and they were lining up on the CVS. I'm like, I don't know what to do, Charlie. Like, you better come down here. But what happened to that? You know, what happens to all of us? But anyway, so Charlie said, don't be afraid to ask God. And I said, okay, God. And I was like, you know what? I've always felt the call to preach, you know? Um, I like being on a stage. I, I, I flourish, in, uh, you know, whether I'm singing, whether what I'm doing. Now, if I go to a party with people and, and a social, I sit in a corner by myself and I don't want to talk to them. I'm, I'm very different. But when I'm, when I'm forced to be in a public area, I, I like it. It's like an energy. And, and that's just how I am. But I said, I said, God, if you're calling me to preach your word, then you got to show me in scripture. Because Charlie said that you'd do that. And I was home. It was like one o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, this scripture just tickertated through my brain. Ezekiel 3.18. I had no idea what Ezekiel was. Um, I assumed it was in the Bible. I assumed if it's about preaching, it had to be somewhere in the New Testament. So I'm looking forward through this Bible. I'm like, there's no Ezekiel. So I went to, and I'm like, oh, it's Old Testament. And that's not about witnessing. What did I hear? But anyway, the question, God, are you really calling me to preach your word? The answer, Anthony, when I say to a wicked person, you will surely die. And you, Anthony, do not warn them or speak out, dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person will die for their sin, and Anthony, I will hold you accountable for their blood. Yeah, after crying, <laughs> I realized, oh, I guess, I guess it's not as fun as I thought it might be to be called to preach. <laughs> like, this is on me? Yes, it's on you, Anthony. Um, but it wasn't by my choosing. I didn't choose the calling I was given. God gives us our calling. Um, like I said, I assumed for a long time that everyone had the same desire to me as me to go and preach, but not everybody does. Not everybody in this room does. Some people would never want to go up on a pulpit and, and speak and, and do these things. You know, it, it's terrifying. I love the fact, and from what I understand, we're starting up Ox Pen Ministries again soon. So that's what Charlie said. I'm, I'm saying it publicly. We're starting, you know, Charlie told me. So we're going to, you know, I don't know when it is. It could be 10 years from now, but no, we're going to start up again soon. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to need it. You know what I mean? Because even if you're not called to preach, what this teaches you is how to be a witness. Every, you know, um, as, as, a, as a young, I, I believe part of, uh, of the preachers are pulpit speakers. We're salesmen. A preacher is a salesman. I, I, I've, I've said before, and not everybody understands it, but you have to understand my heart when I say it. I'll say, I sell cars in the daytime and Jesus on Sunday. Amen. And that's what we do yeah. as a preacher. All right? What's it going to take to get you into heaven today? Right? And, that, and that, that's what we're extroverts. Preachers are extroverts. We're not afraid. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, come on, man. Hey, listen, this, this thing is going to be free, but it's going to cost you everything. But no credit, bad credit, no problem, okay? Christ will take you no matter what. <laughs> yes, fire insurance comes free, right? But that's what it is. And, and, and when I sell a car, I use the, the, the gift God gave me to, 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 to convince someone you know, to spend money to do this and stuff. And when I'm, when I'm, when I'm evangelizing, I'm using the gift God gave me to explain 
So everyone's a little different. Some people are a little more serious. I'm a humor person. I like to make jokes throughout stuff. I, that's why I can, that's why I believe God gave me a gift to be able to preach something that's not necessarily fun, but to make it fun because my God, this is all good news. Yeah. If it ain't good news, I'm out. Yeah. But it's all good news. Um, preachers, and Charlie's a victim of this, sometimes get accused of having egos because that's the way they are. But it's confidence. And it's not confidence in self. Charlie's not confident in himself. I'm not confident in myself. I'm confident in, in Jesus who lives in me. Which is why maybe when I'm up here, I'm so extroverted. And then when I'm in a party, you having to rely on myself. I'm, I'm a meek little mouse and I don't sin because it's just me then. I'm like, Ooh. But, you know, but greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world, right? We all know these scriptures, right? Without Christ, I could do nothing. But with him, I could do everything. So it's, it, it all works. Um, after God called me to preach, he then said something else to me that really shook me. And this was months later. I was outside the church I was attending. They were closed for the day. And I was just outside. I, I mean, I literally would just go there and just sit on the stoop and pray and read my Bible. <laughs> like, you know, I was such a good Christian, <laughs> you know. And um, I'm praying, and God's like, Anthony, do you want the higher calling? I'm like, what's the higher calling? And he was very specific. He says, Anthony, a Christian is called to be separated from the world. People with a higher calling are called to be a little separated from other Christians. And, and it's not like separation, like I can't be around. It's just, it's, it's one of those to whom much is given, much is required things, okay? And I was like, that sounds great. I'm like, you really would do that for me? Like you'd really give me an opportunity to separate myself even closer? He goes, he goes absolutely. And I'm like, oh, and he goes, before you say, okay, if you take this higher calling and walk away from it, you will die. And I started bawling. Because I'm like, I knew this was God talking to me. And I'm like, I don't think I'm ready for the responsibility of that statement. And so I sat there for a couple hours just crying. And then I finally called Charlie. And I'm like, Charlie, this is what God told me. I don't know what to do. But I don't know what to do. I don't know if I should reject this or, you know, I, Charlie, are you sure this was God? Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and, you know, because for a long time, Charlie was kind of like my Holy Spirit censor, you know what I mean? And he said, he said, Anthony, I can't tell you what to do, but God wouldn't offer it to you if he didn't think you could take it. Yeah. I said, okay. And it was very sobering. And I, and I, and I, I had, was driving around at that point when I called Charlie and then I went back to the church and, and I sat there and I said, God, I will receive the higher calling. And then I ran for like 10 years from God completely as far away as I could get. Because <laughs> all of a sudden there was a weight and I was like, uh -uh. no, 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 no. And, um, and I didn't die, but I didn't walk away. I ran away. I think that's why I didn't die, you know, because you can only run so far. But reality is this, when, you, when God puts a calling on you, like we all have a leash on us. And then when you, the, the, you know, he starts tightening the leash, tightening the leash. So he never let me get far. You know, I never, I never rejected him. I was just like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do it. Because I was trying to, I was trying to do it, not letting him do it. I wasn't figuring it out what he wanted me to do. Now, some of us in here are not called to preach from a pulpit. And guess what? That's fine. But you are called to be a witness and to expand the kingdom. There is not a person in here who is not called to preach the gospel in a way or be a witness, okay, and be an example. God cares about one thing, and that's reconciling humanity to himself. That's it. In fact, he, does, he cares about that so much, he sent Jesus to lay down his life for this purpose. We could not do it. He took his only begotten son, sent him to earth to live as a man, a perfect man, to die the die we deserve to die, to receive the punishment we deserve to receive. As a follower of Christ, we're all invited to the wedding. Good news. But you never go to a wedding empty-handed, do you? So what are you going to bring? 
What do you bring into this wedding? And guess what? There's a gift registry. There's a gift registry. There's one thing on it, and it's souls. That's it. That's the gift. And guess what? If you're a born-again believer, you can sit there and keep it to yourself and never share the gospel. And I believe with all my heart, when you die, you will go to heaven. Because it, this is not about salvation and not salvation here. This is about what we're doing on this earth here. And we have to understand there's a big difference. Because if I am in Christ, there's now no condemnation at all. In fact, I've always said that, you know, you know in Christ we are free, right? And, I, and I've said before, before you're, before you're a, a born again believer, before you're saved, you're not free. That's when you're a slave. People think that we're free to do what we want and then we become a Christian. We are a slave to the, no, no, no. When, you're, when you are free, what true freedom means is the ability to do anything without the threat of eternal consequences. As an as a unsaved person, you are dead. You are a slave to that death. No matter how good you are, I don't care if you're a philanthropist. I don't care if you give all your money away. I don't care what you do. You're dying and going to hell. You are a slave. When you become a Christian, you gain freedom. I'm free from me. I'm free from you. I'm free from accusation. I'm free from it all. I can do whatever I want with my gift. But why would I want to hold it in? And some of us do hold it in. Because some of us think that to some of us think that to witness means to be a preacher. Well, I'm not a preacher. Okay, well, what are you? Well, I'm a nurse. My God, you have an opportunity. Well, I'm just a teacher. Hello. And guess what? You can you can witness to your students without saying Jesus all the time. They can look at you as an example. What and what are you giving them? Are you the grumpy one? Are you the finger pointer? Who wants that? Guess what? Some people, the only Christ they're going to meet before they die, until they become born again, is you. So what are you showing them? What are we showing them? What am I showing people? When I sell a car, am I ripping someone off? Is that a good witness? I won't do it. And one of the things I loved about Jennifer, she said, listen, we're not here to sell houses. We're here to advise people on homes. And I like it. Now, I'm a salesman, so I want to make money. But I want them to get a good deal, too. I want, I want everybody to be happy, and that's how I've approached car sales. I, listen, I'm entitled to make a commission. I work my butt off. But you're also entitled to a good deal. So let's meet where, where, where it's comfortable for everybody and put something together. That's why I sell a lot of cars. I'm not trying to rip anybody off. I'm also not trying to give away anything. And if you're upfront and upfront about that stuff, it's good. And, it, and, and, and the same thing goes with what, and, and what that does is it's a witness to people. <clears throat> I pray with every person I sell a car to. I pray for their car, whether they're a believer or not. I say, hey, most of them are. Like, is he, well, most of them say they are, right? Most of them, like, that's the thing about, especially the South, most people know who Jesus is. Whether they received them or not, like, yeah, my, I went to church when I was a little kid. I know about Jesus. He's in there. But most people know. You, you even just go, go to New York. There's people who have no idea who Christ is. Who's Jesus? Like, you go the different, we are blessed. I mean, we live in like, the, the, the harvest is so ripe here. It's ridiculous. It's, e it's easy pickings. You know what I mean? Just help them turn a little bit of their understanding. Help them to understand that, that, that church that they went to when they were a kid, where they were ripped on, and they, that that's not Jesus. Help them understand that. Help them understand that that parent who beat them over the head with the Bible until they were 18 and rejected it, that's not the gospel. Help them understand that. Help them understand they're loved. And I promise you, not only will you be going to the wedding with a massive gift, but we will have a place here that can really impact the community. And that's, what, that's one of Charlie's original visions, is to impact. This is a lighthouse. This is a place of refuge. And it's been a place of refuge for believers for a long time. But it's time to turn the light on the lighthouse so those who are about to hit the rocks can find their way here too. Um, and we, we don't need a class to figure out what our gifts are. I mean, it's awesome that we're having an outreach. And I'm, I'm so happy now that because 
I'm going to have some time in the next couple of months as I'm getting used to things. I'll be able to participate in the outreach. I'll, whatever you need me to do. You need me to clean a toilet? I don't care. I'm excited to be back involved where I can do something on a Saturday. It's very exciting for me to be able to do stuff. But, but at the same time, prepare yourself for it. Prepare, pre let's prepare this place to get filled with blood. And then the Holy Spirit just comes and cleans it all up. But let, 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 let's get, let's get the, the altar fire burning here, right? And if we can get this fire burning bright enough and hot enough, that all they got to do is come near it and it's just going to... Because the altar is a place of death and then life. It's a beautiful, weird thing that we don't understand and I don't even want to get into. But it's just like this thing. I believe, I truly believe that sometimes we don't know how to witness and we don't know what to do. It's simply because we haven't asked God what we should do. I mean, what do you, what do you do? Are you, are you a knitter? Like, do you knit? Like, um, you know, do you play video games? Like, what, what do you do that you can glorify God in? What's your sphere of influence? And I'm not talking about going to Walmart and playing the prophetic game of like, oh, I'm going to witness to that one. Like, I'm not talking about that. You know what I mean? I mean, listen, if God has you do that, then do it. I'm not knocking it, right? However you're going to get the gospel out, get it out. But what I'm talking about, it, it, there is no science to evangelism. There's lifestyle to evangelism. Moths are attracted to a flame. That flame never talks to them, but it appeals to them. The light of God in us should appeal to someone in darkness. And let them come to, listen, Jesus, people came to him. Why would it, why should it be any different for us? Because I don't think we believe it. I'm talking about myself. We don't really get it. We think we got to go out and do the work. When all he did was to go was to go collect the harvest. You know what I mean? It, 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 there's, there's so much. And yes, there's, there's seed planting and there, there's steps and I get it and, and all that stuff. But, but the bottom line is we're not, it's not supposed to be a fruit of labor. It's a fruit of love. It's supposed to be easy. We make it hard because we don't want it to be easy. We don't want anything in life to be easy. You know, we don't. We like to take the hard road so that when we fail, we can blame it on something. <clears throat> but, you know, since, since Jesus ascended into heaven, he's relied completely on us to fulfill the gospel. Completely. Um, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, the Great Commission. Looking forward to getting some great commissions. <laughs> then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then Jesus went, whoop. Where is he? Oh, oh, he's in here? Okay. All right. Stop looking for him to do something that he told you to do. Do it. You want revival? Be revival. You want to see souls get saved? Be a light that attracts them to you. I've said uh, a, little, a little nugget. Like, you attract more people with the handship of friendship than the finger of accusation. That's what they want. They want to be loved. They want to be accepted. And we can love and we can accept. I'm, 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 I'm doing, I'm doing a, I'm, I'm going to be doing a thing in the next month or so where, you know, I'm, I'm a karaoke guy. I like to sing. I like to be on the stage. I like to go out and sing. <clears throat> and I meet a lot of unsaved people out there. And they know me as like a preacher guy. Because I always, you know, I, I don't drink or anything like that. You know what I mean? I go out and I sing and but, but I relate to them, and I talk to them about Christ. And I lead a lot of them, God, I prophesy over them without, without saying, the Lord said this. I just pick it up and just say, hey, you know what? Let me tell you something. And they're like, how do you know that? Well, you know, God loves you. And sometimes I just leave it there. I don't make them say a sinner's prayer right away. 
Let God deal with that stuff, you know? And here's a place for that, you know? And there is a time out there where God, that's when you got to use discernment. God's like, they need you now, you know? But otherwise, just be an example to people. But what I'm, 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 I'm doing some interviews with people that I meet that I'm going to be showing in here soon that, of people that don't go to church and don't believe in Christ, and I want to know what they think of the church. And we're going to kind of listen to what they think about church and then they think about Christians. It's going to help us. It ain't going to be fun <laughs> but, because they're going to be real. I'll make sure they don't cuss. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're going to tell us what they think. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, but no, we, we need to figure it out. And, we, and if, if we, I'm telling you, if, if we're going to have people in here that are, that are going to be going through stuff and getting, and, and getting saved, and, and then the, you know, the next time we, we talk, we need to talk about discipleship. But this isn't necessarily about that right now. This is just about where are we and what can we do to, to build the kingdom. Yeah. Not to build identity, to build the kingdom. And if we build the kingdom, identity will build anyway. It's, it's kind of like one of those, like, you know, giving everything to missions and then the church grow. It's one of those things. Where's the heart? What's the motive of the heart? Yeah. Right? Um, so what do we do from here? And this, I'm going to close here. Um, we need to become productive. We need to let, let God use what we have for his glory. Now, here's the thing. For the born-again believer, you're never going to die. You're never going to die. John 6, 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at that last day. <clears throat> About a month ago, I came into the church on a Wednesday or something. Charlie was here, and I, I was like, you know, I'm just going through stuff, and I want some altar time, and I want to get down, and I want to pray at the altar for a while. I haven't you know, I mean, I remember when I first became a Christian, I used to do that every Sunday. You know, you go to the altar when the preacher would give the service and you, and you know, you do all that stuff. And it was real. It was heart, you know, but I haven't had that for a while. You know, I don't know the last time someone prayed over me and I fell out. You know what I mean? Like it, things are sometimes change, right? But he said, I was sitting there and I, and I closed my eyes and I'm praying and I'm repenting and I'm asking for forgiveness. And, and, you know, I've been someone for a long time that believes, like, you don't necessarily have to ask forgiveness because I'm already forgiven. But when you get in that mode, you just start doing it anyway. And I understand there's a purpose to things, right? And I'm sitting there, and, and all of a sudden, I saw myself in a courtroom. And um, I'm pleading guilty to every charge against me while I'm in this courtroom. Yes, I'm guilty. Yes, I'm guilty. Yes, I'm guilty. And then I saw myself in a cage in the courtroom. because, like, oh, gosh, I'm getting sentenced here, right? And then God said, are you done? I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, then stand up. Well, we'll go stand up, Anthony. I don't need a prisoner. I need a preacher. And then he said, I don't want any more zombie Christians. I was like, zombie Christian? I mean, I... I assuming most of us understand the zombie movies, you know. <laughs> and I was like, explain that to me, God. He says, everyone thinks zombies, they call them the walking dead, right? But actually they're alive in their brain, but their bodies are dead. So they know what they want and they go around looking for it. And he said, yeah, he goes, that's my church. He says, you, you have eternal life. But if you don't eat the bread, drink the milk, start eating the steak, your body starts to deteriorate. Your brain's alive as a Christian. We have the life. We can't die. But we can sure start to rot. We begin to fall apart. And then when we see someone who's not dying, we attempt to eat from them rather than go get our own food. We see someone with life. I've seen preachers do it. They feed off the anointing on someone else. I've seen us do it. I've seen myself do it to Charlie. I need that anointing from Charlie. I need that prayer. If I can just get that prayer, I'll make it through this day. My God, Jesus lives in me. What am I, out of my mind? 
I was a zombie. You know, salvation, you know? <laughs> a zombie is only stopped when you kill the brain in the movies. You got to take it out in its brain. That's how you kill it, right? A zombie Christian is only healed when they destroy the mindset they have and start eating the fruit, drinking the milk, and eating the meat of sound doctrine. So let's bow our heads. Father, God, you are so wonderful and you are so holy and you are so amazing. And Lord, this morning as, as I spoke these words, they, they continue to speak to me, Father God. Lord, I thank you for the calling on my life. And I pray right now for everyone in this room that you would, that you would just, guys, there ain't none of you that don't, that don't know your calling. So don't stop, so stop asking. You know exactly what it is that you thrive in. Help us, Lord God, to start walking in it, to start being it. Lord, we've been, many of us have been like zombies. Alive, never dying, but on the inside, falling apart, rotting away. This morning, Lord God, we replace the mind that we've had with the mind of Christ. Father God, we pray right now for a lost world out there. Lord, there's the lost world within three blocks of here. We've been here for a decade now. Lord God, we've called this place a lighthouse for a long time. But Lord God, I don't think we've turned the light on as bright as it needs to be. So God, maybe we need to just replace the bulb with a brighter bulb. And you're preparing us now, Father God, for outreaches, for times when people are going to be coming here seeking the basic answers of who you are and who they are. Help us, Lord God, to understand how much you love us so that we can then love others in the same way. Lord, for every thought of inadequacy that we've had, we, we, were, we repent from those thoughts. We turn from them. Jesus, sometimes the best way to see you is to look in a mirror. And if we can't see you in that mirror, then we got to fix something, guys. Because he's in us. God showed me one time that he showed me myself underwater with about an inch above me to be the air, but I was underwater and he gave me a little straw and I could breathe through that straw. But it, imagine just being able to breathe through a straw and it, that's all I could get. And God said, that's me, Anthony. I'm in you. I want out of you. Listen, God. And then, then he said, now imagine you put your head above that water and you take that deep, huge breath. How good that feels. God, come out of us. You're never leaving us, but you don't want to be trapped in us. Just like I said in 2019, let this gospel Lord, let this gospel spread wider and bigger than COVID could ever dream of spreading. Attach to the hosts and let us go infect other people with this virus of eternal life. Did what I said tonight make this morning make sense to anybody?
if you're if 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 you're ready start walking it out then just stand up and we're going to pray together we're going to do one of those repeat after me things god he's so amazing you'll never love him as much as he loves you stop trying that's another thing god showed me when he goes just stop trying just just accept it all right let's pray father god I am in you and you are in me you know my gifts today I want to share them not in this building but out there to a lost world I don't care if I get a little burned I'll snatch them out of the fire. I don't care if they reject me because that's a rejection of you. I will be a fool for your gospel. Turn the light on inside of me and make me shine. Make me shine bright. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. To know more about us, go to identitychurch.net, where you'll find resources such as a calendar, media, and upcoming events. You may also download an app for your mobile device from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Then from your mobile device, you can hear our messages, read from the Bible, take notes, connect with us on the social media, and even pay your tithe. Again, thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church.